Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. It's your friendly narrator, Sue, here. And I just like to say, when I was younger, my favorite times would be when my family would gather together. I would go and play with my cousins while the adults sat and talked. But once it started getting dark out, something magical happened. We lit candles and everybody came together the children, the adults, the elders, and we began to share in that candlelight our stories, stories of the paranormal, scary things that had happened to us, family lore, encounters with monsters, all sorts of spooky things. And these were my favorite times as a kid. So allow me to light the candles and invite you wherever you may be into my living room for the next hour, your family. So please, sit, listen, enjoy. Grab a snack, grab a drink, get cozy. As I share with you some terrifying stories, some heartwarming encounters, but most of all, every tale I tell is thought-provoking. Here we indulge in tales of Bigfoot, Dogman, and a whole host of other paranormal entities. So get cozy, cuz here we go. I was 14 at the time and staying with family and their friends at my mother's family homestead farm in northern Alberta, very close to North Buck Lake. Nearest but very small towns would be Grassland, Donneville, or Cassland. Everyone regularly goes fishing at what is commonly known in the area as the Narrows, a tiny connection between two major sections of North Buck Lake as fish there are in abundance. My friend and me decided to return to the farm on his dirt bike ahead of everyone else. About two-thirds of the way back, there's a long straightaway where you either return to another part of the same lake or make a hard right turn, which takes you to the farm, which is at least two miles further. As we turned the corner leading back, I immediately noticed a person walking in the road far off in the distance, a mile or so. As we approached, it appeared darker and more massive. I became more apprehensive and couldn't get my friend's attention as the noise from the dirt bike drowned out my voice. But still, I didn't think anything other than someone walking in the middle of the road until we neared the turn to the farm. What really frightened me was, just before the turn back to the farm, after the long straightaway, my friend stopped the motorcycle and didn't say the word. I tapped him on the back and said, Did you see that? He replied, Yeah, what the bleep is it? Then I saw this creature act like it sensed or knew it had been spotted because it crouched down for a few seconds and then scurried off into the ditch, then the brush. Until that moment, I was convinced it was a person, but the manner that it retreated in was so animal in nature and I had just watched it walk upright more than a minute, probably two. I just about fainted. My friend freaked out and cranked the bike, almost tossing me off the back. As soon as we got back to the farm, we built a huge bonfire and pulled out all the guns. Only twenty-two. The strange thing is that we didn't talk about what we saw, but just acting together knowing we couldn't explain it. There were many old stories from farmers through word of mouth. I found a couple of articles from the Athabasca paper of sightings and tracks near the town and the Athabasca River. It was between 6 and 7 p.m., clear and sunny. The area was known for lots of black bear and blueberries and sand hills. On to the next one. In Morley, in Alberta, it was clear, sunny, and warm. It was late evening. 
my brother, cousin, and two sisters and myself were playing baseball in a clearing near our house. Our game was interrupted by a loud scream. It sounded like a siren and ended in a growl. We all froze in our tracks and tried to figure out what it was that we just had heard. Then another scream was heard. We immediately dropped our gloves and bats and ran for home. The screaming continued until we ran inside of the house. We don't know how much longer it screamed afterward. Whatever it was, it was not an animal that we have heard before. The sound itself petrified us on the spot. We were playing baseball in a recently made clearing by a bulldozer in the woods. Stories of that nature are common in our community. It was around 4 to 6 p.m. It was a nice warm day. The sun was out. It's in the foothills with dense poplar and spruce trees. On to the next one. In the Jasper National Park near Jasper in Alberta, I didn't see a creature, but did see some very clear tracks that obliquely crossed the mud of the North Boundary Trail in Jasper National Park. I was on a solo backpacking trip into the northern boundary country, and I had been hiking for about a week and had not seen anyone in this time except mule deer, grizzly bears, wapiti, and many small animals. It was very early in the season, and I was likely the first person to be on the trail that year, as I had seen no sign of people previous to me not even any evidence of anyone through nearly five feet of snow on the Snake Indian Path. Anyway, I think this was just a few kilometers past Twin Tree Lake, and I was coming out of some heavy bush and going on a slight downward slope toward a boggy area when I came across several large human footprints crossing the trail and going into the bush on the other side, heading toward the boggy area. It was probably near midday, and the weather was warm and sunny, and I was a little weary from the heavy hiking. The prints were very fresh, the ridges between the toes being still damp compared to the wetness of the rest of the prints. There was no debris in the prints despite the breeze and debris on other parts of the trail. The prints had probably been made within the previous 45 minutes. They were very human-looking footprints, considerably larger than my own, with five clearly defined toes, an evidence of toe movement and what appeared to be dermal ridges and cracks in the skin of the foot. They were hourglass shaped and very much larger than even the grizzly bear paw prints that had been planted over my own fresh boot prints a couple of days before. I took no pictures of these human-like footprints due to my incredible stupidity. For some reason, all I could think was stupid park wardens walking around without boot in this kind of country. It wasn't until I'd walked about another kilometer or two that it occurred to me how immensely silly my assessment of the prints actually were and that I had probably been looking at very fresh Sasquatch footprints. That knowledge certainly put a spring in my step to put as much distance between myself and the area that I'd seen the prints as possible. I saw nothing else unusual or uncanny during the rest of the trip. The terrain was heavy brush breaking up into a boggy area. There were mountains all around. I have told very few people On to the next one. In Alberta, approximately 150 to 170 miles north of Peace River, my ex-wife and her family were out in the area of Hag Lake. Her dad was driving a grader for the fire crews, building roads to access the fire areas. There was not much to do, so they fished a lot at Hag Lake. This one day, Denise, her mother, 
brother and nephew were fishing at one end of the lake when Joe, her brother, said, Look at the bear on the other side. So sure enough, they looked across and approximately 500 meters to one kilometer across, and there was a large, hairy thing walking on two legs and coming around toward them. They described it as being big, at least over six feet, and moving quickly on two legs, and not dropping to four legs at any time. The color is the odd thing. She said that it was gray and black in color. Anyway, it was moving too fast for her mother's liking, so they left and went back to their camp. That night at camp, Joe went to take the garbage back to the pit about one kilometer away and came back as white as a ghost and took their dad back with him and showed him some huge footprint. On to the next one. In Kentucky, in Crittenden County, the nearest town, Shady Grove, I was picking blackberries on old West Vaco property when some deer came running out of the eight to ten foot tall trees I was picking berries by. Then I could hear something coming through the trees after them. It was making a growl-like grunt sound. As it got closer, I could see the trees being pushed apart. That is when I could see a hairy arm and hand. I could see a leg and a hip, too. The limbs it was pushing apart were three quarters the way up these trees two rows in. I got my bucket and got the heck out of there. There have been sightings by coyote hunters in 2010, just a half mile from my sighting. On to the next one. In Jackson County in Kentucky, I was deer hunting on a friend's farm. I had been hunting since just before light and was very tired, so I decided to sit by the root ball of a fallen tree. Just before I sat down to rest, I heard rapid gunfire that sounded like it was coming from the other side of the hill I was on. It sounded like two different people were firing at something, so I sat with my back to the root ball of this fallen tree. I kind of dozed off for a few, but I began to hear footsteps coming down the hill from behind me. I thought it might be someone from our hunting party, but it wasn't. I stood up, and as I stepped out from behind that root ball, there it was. I was face to face with a large Sasquatch. We were about 25 to 30 feet apart and in the clear. I was in shock. We stood there looking at each other for about 25 seconds. What I saw that day changed my life completely. This creature was 8 feet tall and weighed 700 pounds easily. This encounter happened about 2 miles from Beulah Lake in Tyner, Kentucky. The nearest road is Oak Grove Church Road. It was on private land. As this creature and I stood there looking at each other, I guess I may have been in shock because I couldn't run. I was armed, but the thought to fire my rifle or pistol never crossed my mind. It would have probably just made it angry. The creature was looking at me with what I can only say was the expression of, oh crap, like it didn't expect to see me there and it didn't know if I would shoot at it. It was between 7 foot 6 and 8 feet tall, about 700 pounds. I'm just guessing the best as I can. We were about 25 to 30 feet apart in open woods, meaning there was no underbrush to block my view. I got a really good look at it. Its hair, not fur, was reddish brown and kind of all over the place, like the hair on an Irish wolfhound that has never been groomed, but I'd say it varied in length. I could see the muscles under its hair. Its eyes were all black. Its face was flat, and it had a nose quite similar to that of a man. Its head was low set, kind of like on its shoulder. Its jaw was pronounced, but not like that of an ape. 
Its arms were very long. The hands were huge. I couldn't see its fingernails. They were black. Its skin color was kind of a grayish brown, and its mouth was open just a little, but I didn't see its teeth. This thing was built for business. I was close enough, and this encounter lasted long enough, about 20 to 30 seconds, that I could see its private part. It was obviously male. All of a sudden, the creature turned to its right and ran to the top of the hill. I tried to keep the trees between us, but I moved a step to my right and watched it go to the top of the hill. There, it stopped, and I got this really uneasy feeling in my stomach. I felt disoriented and got the feeling to get out of there fast. I then turned to my left and made a beeline to the open field that was just a few yards behind me. I walked to the center of the field, noticed where my truck was parked, and went to my truck. I didn't get out of my truck until I saw another member of our hunting party. I have never mentioned it to my hunting buddies because I didn't want to be thought of as a drunk or on drugs. It took me until January 2013 to tell my wife. This encounter changed my life. I haven't hunted since and I sold that rifle. I went back to see my buddy that lives there, but I haven't been back since. I've also had six other visual encounters and one audio encounter in which I heard a wood knock and immediately after that there was a whoop response. These encounters happened in Brea at the home we lived in at the time. The location is in a subdivision in the city limits of Brea, just behind an elementary school. We've since moved. Thank you for listening. On to the next one. In Madison County in Kentucky, my brother-in-law, JT, and I were scouting for a good deer hunting spot on some private land we had just received permission to hunt. Prime land that had never been hunted, so we were excited. We had made a big circle around the perimeter of this farm. Then we decided to circle the edge of the woods surrounding this massive cornfield. We were wearing our camouflage with full coverage over our heads, faces, the whole bit. We had earlier in the day thought we were being followed, but we just thought it was the farm owner's old son following us to see what we were doing. It never occurred to either one of us what would happen next. As we were going to our truck, we had to cross this narrow pathway with high side on our left and right. After thinking about it, it was the perfect ambush site. When we got a little into this pathway, we could hear growling coming from the high ground above us on both sides. Then a large rock about the size of a standard cinder block came crashing in behind us. We stopped, frozen in disbelief. JT asked me if I heard that, which I gave him the yes signal. At this time, we still had our face masks on, so we promptly took them off. That's when there was another growl, only this one was much more threatening. We left without pause and never did go back to that farm. I told the farm owners about our experience and he affirmed that there had been strange things going on there since he was a small child. He told me of a Bigfoot sighting that his family had encountered only a couple of months prior to our event. He told me of this group of things coming into his shed where he had some home cured meat hanging to cure and they took it all. He said he fired a shot over their heads to scare them off, but they were not frightened by the gunfire. He moved about two years after the year JT and I had our encounter. I asked him why he moved, and he said he couldn't take any more intimidation from these things. One note is that his mother still lives on that farm. It's mostly an unkept farm, and she's a fiery little woman. I wouldn't want her upset with me. I would love to try to do an investigation there, but the family is reluctant to have people on their farm. Thank you for listening. On to the next one. 
in Rockingham County in New Hampshire. I was hiking in Paw Tuckaway Park this morning with my two Burmese mountain dogs. On the descent, very close to the bottom of the mountain, we were at a slight jog on snow and ice-covered trail when something about 30 yards ahead moved from my left to my right, cutting perpendicular to the trail. I had a clear line of sight to the incident just 30 yards ahead. My dogs stopped dead in their tracks, and I said, it's just a hiker, guys. But whatever it was, was bipedal, and much bigger than me, and was moving at what must have at a very fast pace. We arrived at the spot and saw nothing ahead, nothing behind, and nothing down and to my right. No sound. Whatever that was had come from my left through the woods on no trail, moved across our trail and down to my right into more woods. I ran ahead thinking it must have been a runner but saw no one and had over a hundred yards of clear sight. I ran back and saw nothing. I am a marathon runner and an athlete myself and no human could have moved that fast over that terrain so as to elude my sight. It was either a ghost, a superhuman athlete, or a Bigfoot. I can't rationalize what I saw. On to the next one. At Monteagle Mountain in Grundy County, north of Chattanooga, Tennessee, Brenda Ann Adkins, a lone witness, became aware of a nauseating smell. There appeared in front of her a seven-foot-tall, hairy humanoid with an enormous chest and huge arms and legs, and it was covered with blackish-red hair. The creature was growling at first and stepped within six feet of the witness. It cocked its head in a quizzical way, stared at the witness, seemed to smile, and then left, made a blubbering noise as it went its way. On to the next one. Outside Clarksville by Cumberland River in Montgomery County in Tennessee, I was told this story by my father. I will do my best to remember the details. My dad and a friend, Jerry, were going fishing I don't know the road names, but I have general information of the location. It was a 30-minute drive from Clarksville, Tennessee. He said they had to drive over Old Railroad Trestle to get to the fishing spot. There were horses and cows in a field grazing. They crossed a cattle gap and parked. They walked down an embankment to the Cumberland River and proceeded to fish. My dad said there was a lot of muskrat activity along the bank of the river. They had been there about 45 minutes with no fish. My dad said all of a sudden everything seemed to stop. No wildlife noise, no muskrat. He said he picked up his 22 rifle and spotlight, then walked to the top of the embankment. He looked toward the fence line where the cows were with the light. He said he saw a set of red eyes along the fence. He estimated its height was seven to eight feet tall. He said he aimed the rifle between the eyes and shot. He said he heard the impact of the bullet and the eyes closed. He fired several more times and heard impact but never saw anything after the eyes closed. He went back down to get his pole. Jerry and my dad didn't reel the poles in. They broke the line and left. When they got back to the cattle gap, he said there were all cows, horses, and a few deer jammed up against the fence, and they had to nudge the animals with their vehicle to get across the gap. Needless to say, they never went back. It was around 9 p.m. It was lightly moderate wood, embankment, and river bottom. It was a remote area with pasture fields. That's all I know. A week prior to this, my dad had heard a horse was killed. Its skull had been crushed. But my dad and Jerry did pass the carcass of the horse. 
on to the next one. Near Smokemont in Sevier County in Tennessee, a husband and wife sightseeing in a car saw a very tall creature. They had been cruising along the road, hoping to see some bear as they rounded a curve. There was a creature coming from the right side of the road, down a grade from some small trees and bushes. It moved across the road directly in front of them, and after entering the bushes on the left hand, angled off in the same direction that they were going. It was over seven feet in height, and had a very long stride, and walked like a human swinging its long arms with its strides. It covered a distance of 100 feet in only a few seconds. It was tall, slender, with smooth, clean, straight hair that covered its whole body. The head just appeared to come straight out of the body with no neck. There was no nose or snout, and there were no ears, so it was not a bear. On to the next one. This was in Crossville in Cumberland County in Tennessee. While home from college on holiday break, I was out visiting friends one night. I had pulled over and was outside the car in a remote area near my home, my parents' home, with a friend. While outside the car, some movement caught my eye on a rock cliff on the opposite side of the road and approximately a hundred feet away. I saw a figure approximately seven feet tall, broad from shoulders down through torso, large head covered entirely with dark hair, standing upright with its arms straight down by its side. No eyes, mouth, ears were noticeable. I stood still for ten to fifteen seconds staring at the image. It turned to its left and disappeared. No sound was made. I hurried my friend back into the car and asked him if he saw what I saw, and he said he only got a brief glimpse of a shadowy movement. Although I definitely saw as described, I have dismissed this as being a person, maybe a hunter in this area, and I was looking upward at the time, so the image could have been distorted. But reading similar sightings since has prompted me to submit this occurrence. It was approximately 11 p.m., dry and still weather conditions, temperature in the mid-40s, sighted from the roadside not far from Bird Creek Bridge on South Old Mail Road. It was standing on a cliff approximately 100 feet from where I was standing outside of the vehicle. It was on a rock cliff overlooking the road. I returned to the exact location the next day and looked around the spot on the cliff. I saw the image, but found nothing unusual. One friend was present, but did not get a good visual. On to the next one. Near Atwood in Gibson County, a nine-year-old girl and her brother would take the trash to the edge of the woods where they would burn it in an old oil drum. They had ridden their three-wheeler, called a scat tracker, down the hill to the burn site and started to burn the garbage. They were watching the garbage burn, and she heard a low growling noise and turned her head toward the right where it was coming from and saw something in the shape of a man that was black and hairy. It was walking into the edge of the woods just over a slight hill. She grabbed her brother and said, what was that? He did not know and decided they should get on the three-wheeler and get back to the house as fast as possible. On to the next one. On South Lick Creek Road in Leapier's Fork in Williamson County in Tennessee, my brother and I were out riding our mini bike one afternoon after school, approximately 4 to 5 p.m. It was the beginning of spring, and we were searching for bait to go fishing. We parked our bike on the road, which at the time was gravel, and traveled very little. 
we walked down a path that was used by a farmer to get to his pasture, where he had cattle grazing. As we walked down the path, I felt as though we were being watched. It was an eerie feeling that still haunts me to this day, as I recall this incident. Off to my left, and approximately 30 to 40 yards away, and 50 or so yards from the main road, was a hairy creature standing in a bent-over slump, raking its arms through a patch of may apples. My brother saw it at about the same time. At that moment, the two of us ran as fast as we could, not looking at each other, but looking at the creature over our shoulders. I was afraid that it would come after us, but it stood in the patch of may apples, looking at us as though it didn't know what to make of us. I have told this story many times since that day. Many people laugh in disbelief, but I know what I saw, and it could only be one of two things. Either someone dressed in a Bigfoot costume, or it was Bigfoot himself. Nothing was heard at all from the creature. There was no odor coming from the creature that I was aware of. My brother and I were engaged in laughter and jokes as we walked down the tractor path. There was a small stream that flowed approximately 30 or so yards from the creature. The area was heavily wooded with hardwood and still is to this day. There is a larger stream, Lick Creek, which was approximately a hundred or so yards from the creature. At the time, there was a one-lane steel bridge that crossed Lick Creek. On to the next one. A six-foot-tall, gray-haired, shaggy biped allegedly assaulted La Chu in March 1955 in Hong Kong. The villager fought off the creature, which ran away on all fours after Chu punched it in the stomach. Large, triangular prints were supposedly found in the dirt, entirely dissimilar to any ape or human track. Multiple witnesses in Priesk Isle, Pennsylvania, were left in hysterics after a metallic object descended on the beach around 9.30 p.m. on July 31, 1966. They watched from their car as the UFO beamed strange lights through the trees. Within moments, an upright, gorilla-shaped, six-foot-tall creature shuffled toward them and scratched their vehicle. The next day, quantities of silicone were found at the landing site, wrote John Keel, along with some peculiar cone-like indentations in the sand, leading to where the automobile had parked. On July 17, 1974, three witnesses watched a torpedo-shaped UFO hover above the valley near Palmdale, California, and jettison numerous dark masses which fell to the ground. Though it was difficult to perceive details, the blobs each had two glowing eyes and dispersed into the forest. According to author Peter Gutilla, all three witnesses displayed symptoms of sunburn and eye irritation the next day. Researchers following up on the sighting discovered 18-inch tracks bearing all the characteristics of typical five-toed Bigfoot prints, but with marked peculiarity. The foot was twisted and displayed strange contractions of the toes in clusters, almost as if fusing together. The middle toes were enlarged. The fourth, fifth, and big and second toes fused together respectively. Other Bigfoot exhibit what may be polydactyl more than five digits. In 2010, North Carolina resident Tim Peeler claimed a 10-foot-tall, blonde-haired Bigfoot wandered into his Cleveland country property. Peeler told authorities he thought the creature might be menacing his dog. The Charlotte Observer reported, adding he saw six fingers on each hand. 
more than three decades earlier, witnesses claimed to have sighted a large, hairy humanoid dubbed Nobby around Carpenter's Knob near a mountain. In summer of 2008, witnesses in northwestern Ontario spotted an upright, human-like creature covered in black fur. A large, six-toed footprint was found in the area 140 miles northeast of Winnipeg shortly afterwards, papers reported. Many of the fabled giants rumored to have once inhabited America, whose skeletons were discovered and purportedly confiscated by the Smithsonian Institution as part of a massive conspiracy, allegedly had six fingers on each hand, six toes on each foot, and double rows of sharp teeth. According to contemporary newspaper articles, numerous specimens were exhumed from indigenous earthworks during the 1800s to 1900 claim supported by the strong precedent for depictions of polydactyl hands and feet in Native American rock art, particularly in the southwest Four Corners area. Hard evidence for these skeletons is scarce. However, leaving most skeptics to level charges of yellow journalism deployed to infiltrate circulation. The subject of hoaxes vis-a-vis -vis oddly towed footprints has been addressed. It would simply be mind-boggling poor choice to fake tridactyl Bigfoot tracks if the goal is to have them accepted as genuine. While genetic mutations are attractive to flesh-and-blood hypothesis advocates wishing to explain peculiar footprints, these remain unsatisfactory explanations for one primary reason. Genetic mutations consistently manifest between feet in clinical studies. Plenty of syndactyly cases in humans only appear on one hand or foot, and synodactyly is even less likely to be identically mirrored on both sides, given its association with trauma. Exceedingly few trackways present fewer toes on one foot than the other. Ergo, if bi tri tectodactyl prints are from a primate, they are much more likely to represent a subspecies than a deformed pentadactyl foot. One popular explanation holds three-toed footprints are misidentified alligator tracks. In fairness, Footprints left by alligators' rear feet do appear similar to tridactyl Bigfoot tracks in the right medium, but their front feet are clearly tetradactyl. Moreover, alligator feet are much smaller than the average Sasquatch footprint, though in the interest of honesty, prints may enlarge on a slippery, muddy riverbank. Even if alligators are responsible for anomalous footprints, in the southern United States, three-toed tracks have been found in locations where alligators would be just as rare as hairy hominids. Precedents exist for tridactyl feet among mammals, including rhinoceros, kangaroo, and of course sloth. There are four species of three-toed sloth and two species of two-toed sloth, which in truth have three toes and two fingers. For this reason, some researchers speculated that Bigfoot leaving behind two- and three-toed prints may represent some type of sloth or other related species. One popular candidate is Megatherium, a 20-foot-long, four-ton, giant ground sloth presumed extinct for 10,000 years. Suffice to say, most Bigfoot witnesses do not describe anything remotely resembling a giant sloth. They are, however, a handful of compelling exceptions, most notably the Mepinguri, a large, hairy beast from the Amazon rainforest. Depending on which tribe you ask, the Mepinguri is tall, seven feet or more when it stands on two legs, and emits a strong, extremely disagreeable odor. It has thick, matted fur, which covers a carapace, that makes it all but impervious to bullets and arrows. The creature can allegedly hypnotize victims. 
While all of these features resonate strongly with Bigfoot lore, some cryptozoologists suspect informants might be describing a relic megatherium specimen. One Peruvian tribesman told a researcher he saw a mampiguri depicted in Lima's Natural History Museum, an institution which has a diorama of a giant ground sloth. It is difficult to scientifically account for primates with oddly numbered toes, but a variety of entities from myth and legend exhibit peculiar foot features. Another curious connection appears in Middle Eastern jinn lore. Jinn can safely, if grossly, be generalized as Muslim analogs to fairies in Christian tradition. Like the Fae, they ate detritus, stole human children, employed changelings, inhabited ancient ruins, and could shapeshift. Even when they appear in beautiful human form, jinn are said to have a physical flaw that exposes their true identity, wrote Rosemary Ellen Guiley in The Jinn Connection. Most common are hairy legs and hoofed feet. This obviously resonates with modern images of Satan, devils, and satyrs, but with the aforementioned zoologist comment that Bigfoot may be forgot to put on the rest of toes. In both instances, a crucial aspect of the entity is presented as malformed or an afterthought. Tridactyl footprints appear in modern encounters with a wide variety of unknown beings, from UFO occupants to cave goblins in Kentucky to Puerto Rico's El Chupacabras to the Lizardmen of Bishopville, South Carolina. Such tracks are so common, in fact, it almost seems as if three-toed print is a calling card for the other world. Indeed, the number three and its multiples are of paramount numerological importance in a variety of occult and spiritual traditions around the world. Three is a heavenly number to the Chinese. Three magi visited Jesus in Bethlehem, Christianity is built around the Trinity. Noah had three sons. Buddhists take refuge in the three jewels. Three gunas define the Samkhya Hindu philosophy. With this in mind, perhaps tridactyl prints like glowing eyes indicate Bigfoot's supernatural origin. Some of the strangest cases share this detail. In the 1981 Bear Scare of Hackney, England, began on December 27th when four boys walking through a marsh happened upon three clawed footprints in the snow. One of the witnesses decided they were bear prints, a fact confirmed by a mysterious couple who told them to keep away because it was dangerous and tossed snowballs at the three youth to frighten them away. Undaunted, the boys soldiered onward until they encountered a gigantic great growling hairy thing, which sent them running. Not only is England devoid of bears, but the tracks discovered by authorities started and finished abruptly and were surrounded by virgin snow. This, however, does not represent the full extent of oddities surrounding Bigfoot prints. Stranger things lurk where the footprints end. On to the next one. On Staten Island in New York, Frank Pizzolatto, 11, and Philip Villo, 12, were in the woods when they saw a six-foot-tall, upright bear which roared at them. They did not think that it was a bear, though. No bears have been known to be on Staten Island since the 17th century. Where did this one come from? On to the next one. On Staten Island in New York, Miss D. Daly was driving late at night and had to swerve to avoid a hairy humanoid less than six feet tall that was crossing the road from the church car park and heading for the rubbish dump and swamp behind the church. Lovely location. It was a biped creature covered with long black hair. The creature was five feet eight inches to five feet ten inches tall 
with a necklace head and arm that swung slightly in front of its body. Two four-toed footprints that were ten inches long were found in the snow the next morning. On to the next one. I live in the western part of New York State. My story concerns a hunting camp I belong to that is approximately 65 miles southwest of Buffalo, New York, and approximately 20 miles northeast of Erie, Pennsylvania. The area is considered rural with second growth forest. My story concerns four separate incidents over a 25-year span. Taken separately, you can probably explain them away, but taken collectively leads me to believe that there may be more to it. A few years ago, my uncle, cousins, and I were at the hunting camp. I do not recall the exact time of year, but it was either late summer or early fall. Late one evening, perhaps 10 or 11 p.m., we heard a very strange, powerful call. My uncle, who was an excellent outdoorsman, could not identify the call. To me, it sounded like a cross between a bird of some sort and a bobcat. As we listened, the animal was moving through the backwoods. After a while, my uncle decided that he wanted to locate the animal making it. The area in question is sandwiched between a large swamp that is very, very difficult to walk through and a 50-acre lake. This area becomes increasingly narrower and an animal would most likely pass through a narrow tract of land approximately 200 yards wide before crossing a road. So he, my cousin, and I headed out into the night. My uncle took us to a field that sits next to a narrow track. Here we waited. The animal was getting closer. When it was maybe a hundred yards away, it stopped calling. We could not see it, nor do I believe it could see us. We waited for some time, but it never called again, and did not cross the road. There were three witnesses, my uncle, my cousin, and me. The sighting was 10 or 11 p.m. Of the weather conditions, I can only recall that it was not raining. The area is pine, hardwood, second-growth forest, with a large pond and swamp. I almost forgot about this incident until very recently. Fast forward a few years, my uncle, while out hunting in the same area as mentioned above, claims he had seen a Bigfoot. As he relayed the story, I could tell he was visibly agitated and quite forceful in his conviction in what he had seen. Now, I must tell you a couple of things about my uncle. First of all, he died a few years back, so unfortunately, I cannot question him further. But he was an excellent outdoorsman. He had hunted small and big game all along the eastern part of North America. When he was younger, he would go to Ontario every spring and fall near James Bay to hunt bear and moose. I would say he was very familiar with bear and their habitat, so I am sure it was not a bear he had seen. But he also liked to drink whiskey and beer, so when he told us he had seen a Bigfoot, I am sure all of us, including me, thought he must have been hallucinating. However, as I think back about my uncle, even when he was quite drunk, I had never known him to make up stories. He certainly liked to retell his stories over and over again, but they were always factual and never varied in detail. In the fall, my brother-in-law told me while cutting firewood in the same area, he had seen something very large. He did not get a good look at it because it frightened him so much he hopped into his four-wheeler and left the area immediately. At the time, my brother-in-law did not know of my uncle's Bigfoot story, so I was quite intrigued. I asked him questions as to the size and color, but he could only say it was very large and black in color. 
I did not follow up to investigate the area because some time had passed since the incident and he had gone back into the same area without seeing anything unusual. Two months ago, while reading a media story that Bigfoot is dead, I came across multiple Bigfoot websites. On one website, there are recordings of supposed Sasquatch vocalizations. As I played one of the recordings, I almost fell out of my chair. It was the same vocalization I had heard years ago. The sight and sounds of the night so long ago came back to me in a flash. It was this last incident that captured my interest and convinced me to write my account. I admit, though I do have some issues with the possibility of a Sasquatch living in the area, there's never been, to my knowledge, any other sightings in the area. The area in question, although rural, seems a bit too populated for one or more animal to avoid detection. Even when an occasional bear wanders through, it always seems to get spotted from time to time. I, too, have hunted and hiked over the same area many times in the past and have never seen anything to suggest a large creature living in the area. The area supports a large deer population, but I have never come across a deer kill in the manner described online. To be fair, although I raise these issues, I also have never actively looked for signs of Sasquatch. On to the next one. Whitehall Police Sergeant Wilfred Gosling and his brother Russell heard an eerie, high-pitched scream for one minute while they were hunting at the intersection of Abair Road and Route 22A in Whitehall. It was not an animal they recognized. On to the next one. Two boys in Watertown in Jefferson County in New York saw an eight-foot-tall Bigfoot covered in black hair. Fifteen-inch tracks were later found. On to the next one. In Jefferson County in New York, a hairy humanoid was seen by Dennis Smith and Kimmy Slate. The creature was eight feet tall, black and covered, and was seen at sunrise. Minutes later, they saw it again walking through a field. On to the next one. A state trooper saw a large, hairy, ape-like figure 75 to 100 yards away in a field near Abir Road. The creature had the same pink eyes and description as other sightings. The creature made a loud scream like a pig squeal or a woman's scream. On to the next one. In Washington County, New York, a hairy humanoid was seen. Marty Paddock, Bart Kinley, and Paul Gosselin saw the creature three times that day. Initially, it was only Marty and Paul who saw the beast in a field near Abir Road at around 10 p.m. Originally, it was standing on the side of the road. The creature was human-looking, and the two boys went to the end of the road and turned back. They stopped and heard a noise like a pig squealing or a lady screaming. They drove off to the top of a hill, locked the doors on the truck, loaded the guns, and pointed it out the window. They drove back to the opposite side of the road to get a better shot at it. At first, they did not see it, but eventually they saw it standing near a telephone pole about 70 feet away. It began running towards their truck, and they slammed the truck into gear and burned about 57 feet of tire rubber down the road. They went to the Whitehall police, but no one would believe them there, even though Paul was the son of a policeman. He was off duty at the time. Both of the men then went and got their friend Bart Kinley, who they told about the sighting, and they all drove back to the spot where it was still standing. It had big red eyes and just stood there without moving and was seven to eight feet tall and 300 to 400 pounds in weight. Thick, short brown horse hair covered it 
with the head hair being longer. They returned to the Whitehall police station and reported it again. The police contacted the state police and the sheriff's patrol. Gotham's father, Wilbur, joined the group, and they walked into the field where the monster had been and heard a frightening scream. A sheriff shone a spotlight into a field and saw something walking along a fence. The following are a collection of wild man accounts from the turn of the century which share a remarkable resemblance to modern day Bigfoot and Sasquatch accounts. A wild man is running loose in the woods out there, and the women and children are scared to death. Such was the message Chief Deputy Sheriff Drew received over the telephone from Carriston Friday morning. He at once dispatched deputies McKinnon and Van Meer to gather in the lunatic, who had, it was reported, just gone into a house adjoining A.S. Carey Mill and upset a hot stove. A wild man who lives in the brush and scares little girls is said to have been seen in the neighborhood of North 34th and Stephen Street, Tacoma a number of times lately. The police are looking for him. They have tried several times and failed. Tacoma has a wild man at her outskirts. The dispatch does not say what he is wild about. On to the next one. Doc, a trained monkey belonging to Gentry Brothers Circus, has caused the section of Tacoma in neighborhood of 24th and 23rd Street and Pacific Avenue to be considered haunted for two weeks past. Strange noises have been heard on roofs and balconies, and articles of different kind have been disappearing from houses. Children and nervous women have seen a fantastical animal, the size of which was described as being all the way from that of a big dog to that of a gorilla flitting about the neighborhood. It was simply Doc rustling a living and amusing himself. Eddie Mills arrived, going back over to Gentry Brothers' route in hopes of locating the monkey. He heard of the haunted neighborhood and made a beeline for the locality. From what he knew of the monkey's habit, he soon succeeded in locating him. But... Doc at once declared a pronounced aversion to the fish pots of circus life, and Miles could not get near him. Tonight, Mills is the most tired man in Tacoma. He declares he has climbed over the roofs from 40 to 50 houses, besides leaping fences and careening over hedgerows, and once in a while scaling a tree. Doc enjoyed the sport mightily, and at a late house was keeping a weather eye on Mills while looking for a place to spend the night. On to the next one. Snohomish in December 7th. A wild man, strong and ferocious as any beast that roams the wilds of the forest of the northwest has created a reign of terror among the inhabitants of small towns along the Monte Cristo branch of the Northern Pacific, assert a recent report. This animal or man, whatever it is, has been seen several times during the past year in this part of the country. The last person to see it is John O'Leary, a timber cruiser who is now in Seattle. On to the next one. Seattle, December 13th, a wild man, strong and ferocious as any beast that roams the northwestern forest, has created a reign of terror among the inhabitants of small Washington towns along the Monte Cristo branch of the Northern Pacific. Nels Helgenson, recently from St. Paul, was attacked by the monster while in the brush, and says it walked upright and wore a few ragged garments about its abdomen, and carried a rusty rifle, which was leveled at Helgenson. 
the hammers clicking several times without shooting. The strapping Swede grappled with his assailant and got the worst of the match. The loggers laughed at his story until the day before Thanksgiving, when John O'Leary, a timber cruiser, went into the same neighborhood for game and had a similar experience. He went to sleep in a deserted cabin and was awakened by a demonical yell. Arising, he was knocked to the ground again, but hit the thing with an axe as it lunged for his throat. It then slunk off with a piteous, half-human wail. In the moonlight, O'Leary could see it moving in an upright position. It had a hairy body and face. Many old-timers at Granite Falls say they have seen the wild man, who is believed to be a Frenchman who took up a timber claim near Mount Pilchuck five years ago and disappeared mysteriously two years later. The supposition is that solitude drove him crazy, after which he lost much of his resemblance to the human by living wildly. On to the next one. Tacoma, Washington, February 5th. A man has thrown the residents of Oakland addition into a panic by his chasing 19-year-old Norma Bird while she was returning home after visiting a neighbor. Saturday morning, while on his way to work, a laboring man was attacked by the wild man who tried to snatch the laborer's dinner pail. The laborer was passing a clump of bushes when the wild man stepped out and grabbed the pail. In a surprise, the laborer turned and jerked hard on the handle, spilling a portion of his lunch. At the same time, he made a movement toward his hip pocket as if reaching for a gun. The wild man snatched a piece of bread from the ground and darted away through the bushes. Since Friday, the wild man has been camped in a deserted shack in the woods near the schoolhouse. At times when seen by children, he is said to be perfectly rational. At other times, he dashes madly through the brush or stands with his feet spread apart and beats his bare chest. He spent Saturday carrying pieces of bark and chips from various parts of the woods to the shack. This morning, Miss Bird, while passing along a path leading to the schoolhouse, when the man suddenly jumped out of the bushes and took a few steps towards her, with a frightened cry, she ran toward the schoolhouse, where she reported her experience. The police were communicated with, and several patrolmen were dispatched to search the woods. About two weeks ago, another wild man camped in the woods for several days, frightening women and children in the neighborhood. At times, he would hop about like a frog or crawl about on his hands and knees. He suddenly disappeared. The actions of the man now wandering about the woods lead the police to believe him to be Alex Lamore, who escaped from the asylum last week. Lamore is said to be a dangerous man. Asylum guards have had several fights with him. It is feared he will seriously injure or kill someone. A wild man in a nude state has been seen a number of times in the vicinity of South Tacoma, and a general hunt of patrolmen and citizens is on for him. The man runs like a deer when sighted and succeeds in hiding in the brush. On to the next one. Early yesterday, Dr. H. L. Smith notified the police for the past 10 days. A man has been seen in the neighborhood of 20th Avenue and Mill Street acting in a suspicious manner and seemingly demented. Yesterday, a squad of police was put in search of the man who again appeared, this time stark naked and raving mad. Men of the neighborhood, before the police arrived, arrived, tried to catch him, but he ran off like a deer to the south of the city. He was last seen on the 17th, headed south, and is probably in eastern Oregon by this time, if he continued at the same rate of speed. 
I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!